I want people to understand what drug addiction is about. More than that, I want them to understand what I'm about, you know, what my life's been about. And my life has been like, a lot of my life has been really wonderful, but then a lot of my life has been really dark and very strange. Born James Johnson Jr. in Buffalo, New York. He was connected to the music world at birth as the nephew of Temptation singer Melvin Franklin. In an impulsive moment, at age 15, he joined the Navy. Justifiably overwhelmed, he went AWOL and took refuge in Canada. It was there that he formed his first band, a rock soul collective called the Minor Birds, which at one point featured Neil Young. Changing his name to Rick James, he landed a deal for the band with Motown Records. But upon returning to the U.S., he ended up in jail for abandoning his Navy training. After his release, he relocated to Detroit. And though the Minor Birds dissolved, he maintained a relationship with Motown as a staff songwriter. He developed the R&B band, The Main Line, in England and spent much of the 70s traversing the Atlantic as he developed various projects. In 1977, he assembled his mighty Stone City Band and stepped into the spotlight as a solo artist. His debut LP, Come and Get It, released by the Motown imprint Gordy in 1978, launched the R&B smashes You and I and Pot Anthem, Mary Jane. He capitalized on the popularity of the latter tune by assembling a girl group, the Mary Jane Girls, who accompanied him as a warm-up act as did young firebrand named Prince. During his tours for subsequent releases, busting out of L7 and Fire It Up, more R&B hits ensued, notably busting out Love Gun and Big Time. Uh, let me ask you a very obvious question, Rick, because it's the first time you've been here. I'm sure it's going to be of interest to people uh, how the band got together, because apart from the fact that it's Rick James, it's also a band in itself, the Stone City Band. It's like um, four bands in one. Um, I record the Stone City Band. They have two albums out that, that we've done, separate from my own. And uh, the girls here got an album coming out probably this winter, this fall. The Mary Jane Band, that's the three of them. <laughs> and um, the Punk Funk Horns, which are my foreign foreign players, leader uh, Danny LaMille. So really it's like four groups in one. I mean, it's like a big family, right? Yeah, yeah it is. Very you, big family. You come from Buffalo, yeah. you yeah. moved for a while to Los Angeles, right? And then went no. back to Buffalo. Well, how did it work out? Yeah, we, um, well, we started, most of us are from <laughs> Buffalo. Some of us from New York City and uh, Los Angeles. And we moved to LA. And then we, because of the earthquakes, we moved back <laughs> to Buffalo. <laughs> Though his bond storming jams made him famous, James also displayed a mastery of silky balladry, displaying the supple end of his powerful pipes. It was with 1981's Street Songs that James Vision, booty rocking bass, bulletproof horn charts, rock tinge guitar riffs, new wave synthesizer blasts, and strutting lascivious vocals could at last be fully apprehended. The platinum disc rambunctious Give It To Me Baby, a dance floor hurricane that rivaled anything in the catalogs appears like Michael Jackson, Earth, Wind and & Fire, and George Clinton became a number one R&B and number one dance hit and reached the top 40 while Fire & Desire, featuring his young protege, Tina Marie, proved a splendid quiet storm ballad and ghetto life a formative influence on the gangster style that would evolve later in the decade was instantly enshrined as an inner city classic 
but it was the unstoppable super freak that made James a household name. The frisky funk anthem about a girl you don't bring home to mother shimmied up to number 16 at pop, dominating the clubs and attracting a rabid mainstream audience. So much so that James played himself on the hit TV series, The 18, and performed the song in the episode. Unfortunately, the hedonism that catapulted Rick James into the global limelight became his worst enemy. Success prompted him to party like a Roman emperor and to overextend himself. In addition to mounting his own lavish tours, he produced the Mary Jane Girls, worked with The Temptations, and wrote and produced comedic actor Eddie Murphy's hit single, Party All the Time. He continued to churn out plenty of his own hits during the early 80s. However, including Cold Blooded, Glow, Dance With Me, Standing on the Top with The Temptations, Sweet and Sexy Thing, Can't Stop, Hard to Get, You Bring the Freak Out, Ebony Eyes with Smokey Robinson, and several others. His last big hit as a solo artist was 1988's Lucy's Rap, featuring MC Roxanne Shante, which vaulted to the top of the R&B charts. In 1990, as rap music began to penetrate the mass market, the grandly theatrical MC Hammer scored a worldwide smash with You Can't Touch This, a hip-hop cocktail that got its kick from a super freak sample. Rick James claimed his first and only Grammy Award as the co-author. The remainder of the decade was especially difficult for James, whose drug addiction worsened drastically. His legendary bad behavior sparked legal difficulties and even a two-year prison stretch. Rick James, good evening everybody, it's now 11 o'clock. He wasn't held for long, in fact he's out, he's free again at this hour tonight, but Jeff Michaels with the Channel 7 News Van with a live report about what happened to Rick James tonight at the corner of Yucca and Coenga. Well, what happened? Well, I'll tell you, Paul, this one's a hard one to put together. We are on the corner of Yucca and Coenga. Rick James was most certainly arrested right here, probably the most infamous corner in Hollywood for drug trade. And uh, a couple of undercover officers observed a suspicious transaction involving a male who has identified himself as Rick James. The officers uh, detained the male and conducted an investigation. And as a result of the investigation, the male who's identified himself as Mr. James is going to be released. It was a month ago yesterday that Rick James was arrested along with his girlfriend, Tanya Hajazi, for allegedly imprisoning a 24-year-old woman in his Hollywood Hills home, torturing her allegedly with a hot cocaine pipe and forcing her to commit sexual acts on his girlfriend, Tanya Hajazi. Well, it was about a week ago, or rather a week ago Saturday, on August 24th, that Rick James was released. His bail, his million-dollar bail, cut in half to $500,000. And frankly, we haven't heard much from Rick James until tonight. Now, I just got off the phone with his attorney, Robert Sheehan, just a few moments ago. He tells me that Rick James left his office, left Mr. Sheehan's office after a defense con uh, conference at about 2.45, said he came over to Hollywood apparently to buy some airline tickets and that he was flying to Hawaii tonight with his girlfriend to get away for a while. Obviously, he did not make that flight. Mr. Uh, Sheehan says this is purely a case of police harassment. On the other hand, police did not charge Mr. James. He is free tonight. We assume, or Mr. Sheehan assumes, he is going to be able to make his flight to Hawaii sometime tomorrow, and he is scheduled to appear in court on those charges he and his girlfriend are facing September 11th. Paul and Ann, that's what we know from the corner of Yucca and Coinga. Back to you. James.
Yeah. Now, how about you and cocaine? Is that finished now? Yeah. Yeah. Did you go to a program or do it yourself? How did How did you? No, I mean, I, I don't think I don't think there's a such thing as 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 doing it yourself. I mean, ending it yourself. You always need support, and you always need the help of others. You know. Thank God, I have a strong support group. You know, I have a uh, friends and. Uh, band members and, and associates and you know and and you know there's and a doctor you know I was under doctor's care for okay. uh, about six months after I got out and he gave me a lot of help but but basically it was friends and, and family you know I mean don't get me wrong Tom there's always a thing in the back of your mind sometimes you want to do it I mean I wake up in the morning and it's sunny and nice and then, oh it's I think I'll do some cocaine you know it's really nice day, you know it'll be raining oh I think I'll do some cocaine you know whatever you know anything anything can spark it how how addictive uh, is, is is that drug you know I dabbled with marijuana back in the 70s and early 80s and, but, I, but, uh, but I and hello and I and, but I, and, I never hello? went to oh, wait a minute I never went Tom, to I'm not hearing you <laughs> What do we, we dabbled with marijuana? Yeah, we did. Said, yeah, we dabbled. What else did we dabble we with? We didn't dabble with anything else. Never had the urge. I like to. the way he looks over when he says it. We didn't dabble with anything else, Rick. We just, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever known anyone just to dabble with marijuana. All right, I used it, okay? Oh, okay, there we go. All right. All right. Smoked the hell out of Smoked it. Smoked the hell out of yeah. it. Damn right. Okay. No, I, it, um, cocaine is, is, is a funny drug because when I was, so, I, let me tell you a little short story. When, we, when me and my band, the Stone City Band, were together, every album we made, for the 15 or 17 years that we were making albums, and I'm talking about albums that sold millions of copies, every album we did, we never failed to have an ounce or two sitting right there on the console. Really? A big bag of Quaaludes, okay? Uh, Crystal Champagne and Jack Black bourbon and, you know, all at our, all at our uh, beck and command right there. I don't think I've ever made an album other than for the last few years that didn't have cocaine, and I was snorting it. And we'd stay up for weeks making these albums, and we were doing like three or four albums a year. I was doing myself, I was doing Tina Marie, I was doing the Mary Jane Girls, I was doing the Stone City Band. Uh, I did Eddie Murphy under, under the same... See, what I influence. can't figure out... You know, Wait, but my point is, okay. when I stopped snorting and started smoking, then that's when my addiction skyrocketed. Because after you have that first hit of cocaine, it's nothing has... It's so... It's like... A million to the difference is astronomical compared to snorting. I mean, there was there wasn't a rush in the world that I had ever had in my life, other than maybe sexually or something. What I can't understand is how you can work when you're stoned, because having been stoned, I knew when I was in that in that condition after smoking dope, I couldn't come in and do a show or or, or do a newscast. Well, marijuana was easy. I mean, we did marijuana. We woke up in the morning. We called it Mary Jane. We wrote a national song about it. You know, I love you, Mary Jane, that kind of thing. And, you know, we, we smoked all the time. We never really thought about it. And I think one of the ways we were able to make so many albums off it, because the whole band did it. Everybody but maybe one guy in the band. The whole band did it. And we were all in accord with one another. Right, so everybody's on the same wavelength. Everybody was on the same plane. I mean, everybody was snorting, and everybody was creating, and everybody was singing. But, and this went on for 15 years, us making albums like this, you know, like before we went on stage, mm -hmm. after we went on stage, during the making of the albums, then about 15 years later, 17 years later, one day we sat and we had a one-on-one -on -one in the studio, and the whole dimension changed. It was like we couldn't make an album. I couldn't sit and make an album mm -hmm. anymore. It's a very strange thing. I think I have to ask my doctor, why is that? Yeah. Even as his personal troubles captured headlines, James' work continued to shape popular music. The rapidly growing hip hop scene built countless tracks on the foundations of his songs. James began to reclaim his reputation in the 21st century, aided by the 2002 release of the sprawling two-disc set anthology, which at last represented the range of his work to the world. He appeared on Chappelle's show to lampoon his high-flying superstar image in 2003, turning I'm Rick James, bitch, into a ubiquitous catchphrase. His own final studio work came in the form of a reunion with Tina Marie for her 2004 album. He
He was at work on a new album and an autobiography when, in August of 2004, he was found dead in his home of an enlarged heart. Rick James's genius included constantly reaching, developing, and exploring new aspects of his talent. He has been an inspiration to his peers and earned the acclaim of audiences and critics alike since bursting onto the scene in the late 1970s with his unique brand of punk funk music. James died far too soon, but his legacy inspires new generations of artists to get their freak on. I thank for all the prayers, all the intercession that came through, you know, to help me uh, where I'm now. But yeah, it, 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 it was a wake up call. You know, sometimes you gotta be really silent to hear what Allah has to say to you, you know? And uh, you, you gotta be really just, and I, I think uh, that was that was like a warning and uh, a time for me to listen. And, and I did. So, uh, you know, my life has basically been, uh, I appreciate every, every day that I wake up. You know, there's a saying in, in what I believe in called being taqwa. And that is being God conscious. And, and I'm that every day. I thank God every day that I wake up, man. Don't forget to comment below. Also, like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching.